Thank you. Great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. I actually met this guy at the tram station the other day and uh, I started a great conversation. Then the tram came and we didn't finish. So I'm very much, I'm very happy that I'm introducing him today and I get to finish that conversation in his talk. So please welcome Dan Shearer. He's talking about the EU says the laws of mathematics apply in Australia. Dan Shearer. Hello, everybody. So what I've got up there is a very famous quote, um, apparently instantly recognizable. The uh, submissions committee just said, yeah, uh, <laughs> something like that. Um, so world famous Pratt made a world famous comment. Uh, it's all over YouTube, lots of hits. But it actually does obviously highlight one of the important issues of our day. So what I thought I would do is quickly run over some of the essential non-technical bits about the equally famous European Union approaches to this stuff, and then get into the technical parts and we can return to the non-technical uh, if there's questions and so forth. Do feel free to interrupt. So the headline, the headline act, um, I discovered when poking about that there is a long, long trope, of two plus two equals five, which Mr. Turnbull um, is definitely a part of. Uh, George Orwell, who'd have thought it? That's exactly what it's about. So um, I looked a bit harder and I found uh, loads of people have used this. Mr. Turnbull is making a fool of himself, lining himself up with 1984, um, and no doubt plenty of other, even more eminent people have said the same thing. So the main point of this is, of course, I think you no know, news to anyone in the room that we need privacy to protect our rights online. Uh, that only works if there is security, because if someone can look into all your stuff, then you don't have privacy to start with. Um, and mass doesn't pick favorites. Either 2 plus 2 equals 4, or it does not, and it's wrong. And that, of course, is the problem that many world leaders have been grappling with. Uh, certainly not just Mr. Turnbull, he was just the silliest. So the law requires security for your personal data, if it's going to be any good at all. Uh, the law requires security for your communications, if it's going to work at all. And math says we can have it so that it is secure and works, or it doesn't. And there's no middle ground. Math doesn't pick favorites and say only the good guys can look. So I think that's familiar to everybody. Um, what I thought we would do is just come up with a little format where the Australian experience, as experts here have been telling me this week, is very, very different to the European experience, but not so different to the European experience before they got a clue. So maybe we can leapfrog. I, I say we. I actually live in Scotland. This is, this is quite conflicting. Um, so here we have with a font challenged uh, list of experts at this conference is Lindsay Jackson from Electronic Frontiers, EFA, uh, Lizzie Shea, uh, keynote tomorrow, and uh, Sarah Germain. I'm not really not sure what happened. Um, I don't actually have any problem with these people. Uh, we're going to quickly go over geography because as it happens you can't really talk about digital before we talk about geography because that's the way the laws work. Eventually somewhere there is a court, a court has a judge that goes kabang with a gavel and that sits in a country. Uh, and then we look at the different components that the EU has put together for its famous laws and then we look at the wording which comes down to weasel wording for the likes of the people here weasel wording that allows us to jam in the mathematics we would like to see. And we'll go through a worked example, and then people may want to come back to some of the earlier bits. So um, there are things I'm not covering because this is absolutely massive. Human rights framework in, in digital law. Um, how the EU works, I mean, there is a difference between the Council of Europe and the European Council and the Council of European Councillors. That doesn't matter, but at some point it does. <laughs> a digital single market, which is amazing. All of the technical geek committees who put together legislation, some of which is very pretty, we're about to see it. Um, uh, Brexit and the United States. All of that 
is very relevant to digital rights online. Geography. If we're talking about Europe, and imagine you're an ISP and you care about where this IP address came from, is registered to, or is going to, geography matters. Is it European? Is it not? Are we talking about Europe? Are you talking about the European economic area? And so on and so forth. But it's vaguely that bit of the world. And for the benefit of a good many of the shopkeepers, tram drivers or riders and uh, some people at this conference, I live in Scotland. That's Scotland. It does exist. It's nowhere near Canada and it's intimately attached to England. Thank you. So the components of EU data law are as follows. We have the European Convention on Human Rights. You've possibly heard about this. Um, that's the thing that the right-wingers reach for and they say uh, it's, it's um, uh, rights gone mad. 1953, uh, a codification um, signed up to by 49 countries, I believe, including the likes of Turkey and Russia. And it's from there that anything in Europe, including digital rights, derives. We have country-specific law. Unlike some seem to feel, a, mem a European member state is completely sovereign. It has its own rights. It has its own laws. And it can say whether it's going to send an aircraft carrier somewhere or anything like that. There's a whole bunch of things that belong to that country. That's where you get the great variety diversity from. However, each of those countries have signed up to a bunch of things on the left. And we'll go through the ones that matter. Um, the only way this stuff can work is if there is an overarching court. I believe that's one of the issues in Australia where you have state and federal and regulations and laws and, and it's all starting to coalesce. Um, in the EU, there is the Court of Justice, EU Court of Justice, and it works out how to apply these laws. Um, what did Larry Ellison used to say? One throat to choke, I think. Two of these relate to large telcos, oil and gas, any essential utility providers, um, and specify some minimum standards. Everyone has got to have internet. That internet has, shall have certain properties. Those properties uh, shall be backed up um, as a matter of right. So the NIS directive, um, EU Electronic Communications Code, it has security mandated and baked in. And the definitions for security, which relate back to here, the GDPR, many people in Australia have heard of it. Um, it's, it's sort of the flagship first keystone piece of legislation of the five or possibly six that are coming down the line. Um, and its um, cousin, its little brother, Lex Specialis, it's called, is e-privacy regulation, which has not yet been passed, but we do expect in, it to be passed in some form or other. Um, so these are the components. There's an incentive component, and this is the key bit. So if in Australia you're putting together a law, um, it really helps to have teeth. Uh, this isn't imaginary. Large fines have already been imposed since uh, August 2018 when this came into effect, up to 4%. This really, really has teeth, and that is why the mathematical or the computer science stuff we'll be looking at later on actually matters, because what a system administrator might do in the matter of choices or a developer in terms of design um, can and has already, in part, fed through to 4% fines on global turnover. Um, so that's the way it got everybody's attention. Lots of fear, lots of uncertainty, but, in, crucially, in some... Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> it looks great here. Okay, so thankfully, this was not a crucial slide. Um, I thought I caught all of those. Right. So the components are we have the GDPR, the Network Information Systems Directive, which says to the large utility providers, get your act together. Um, the, uh, the Electronic Communications Code for um, traditional telecoms providers, but also over-the-top apps like Voice over IP uh, and makes um, binding statements or re binding requirements about how those things are to be delivered and uh, that if you are seeking to provide a service, 
then you must um, have minimum standards of privacy and security. And then um, the EU Cyber Security Act, which provides funding for certs, basically, a whole lot of country-based certs, and a whole lot of funding for best practice type community activities in order to raise awareness. Um, and open source is specifically mentioned. I'm not going to get distracted on these non-technical matters, but you can see it's a very large ecosystem of interlocking things. It comes down to the wording of the law, and I'll slow down a little bit here, because it is in the detail of this law that was cooked up by technical geeky committees and really good expert advisors on, uh, in the whole that came up with the laws we're working with. They are well aware there have been some spectacular failures in the past. The previous e-privacy um, directive, not regulation, was the one that had the European cookies law, which made a laughing stock, obviously, of Europe. It was meant to be anti-tracking and so forth. It really didn't work well. So this time around, a lot of work has been put into getting it right. And they started with human rights. So there is an EU charter of human rights, which is one document, pulls together all of the human rights referred to in all the rest of EU legislation. It is compatible with the European Charter of Human Rights. It's updated in the sense that it includes digital rights very explicitly. And they, what they chose to do was pick out Article 8 and Article 7 and have a separate piece of legislation for each one. Article 7 is uh, about communications and, and confidentiality of communications. However, more fundamental to that is Article 8 which is the privacy of your personal data, the GDPR. And interestingly, the GDPR only applies to a natural, breathing human person, whereas the e-privacy um, proposed draft applies to any legal person, or indeed it would seem uh, any bot representing a legal or natural person. And that's really interesting when it comes to confidentiality of communications. So this is the only, almost the only bit I'm going to quote, but it is so fundamental. It's a rights-based approach, which I think, to my limited understanding of the Australian situation, uh, is, is not at all what we have here. So if you read the preamble, it's full of human rights stuff not just the ones about a private life and your privacy of your personal data, but respect for the privacy of these things, plus freedom of thought, conscience, religion, expression and information, freedom to conduct a business, right to a fair trial, diversity, non-discrimination. Um, there's one or two that are referred to in, uh, at least indirectly in later recitals. So the point is, that here we have a piece of law that actually speaks to specific bits of computer science which has massive fines and which is explicitly derived from human rights legislation. You've got to admit that's a good start. The devil's in the detail, of course, but there's been nothing like it. That's why many other countries are saying, well, is this a gold standard? At least we've not seen it before. I think New Zealand and quite a few other countries are looking to this. Um, it starts with scope. There was a map up there before. Um, there's 27, possibly quantum 28 countries in Europe right now as I speak. But then there's another bit, which is the European Economic Area, which has got another bunch of countries, just a few, that have signed up to the rules but aren't part of the EU. Um, Switzerland, Norway, and a few others. So straight away, if we're trying to do some kind of computerized determination of what applies to a given IP address, we already have to decide about scope, which relates back to this piece of binding legislation. Processing the data, it can happen anywhere in the world, by anybody at all, any company or individual, um, commercial individual, so long as it has to do with somebody who is an EU resident, wherever they are in the world, these 
bits of legislation, these fines, these human rights apply. And in that very broad scope, and given the global nature of many companies, you can see that a lot of companies are finding that this is a bit of a race to the top because if you are some global corporation, how does it make sense for your processing centre in, say, Melbourne, not to be able to touch anything that might be in Europe because you then might trigger the fines which will then be levied on your European subsidiary? And so you might as well just be compliant as you can. So, the interpretation, as always with law, how do we view it? How's it going to go down in court on, our, on the day? Um, is it just theoretical? Is it toothless? No, it's not. There have been some really large fines in different countries. Um, Google has, has suffered. Uh, Motorola has suffered. Um, you, Siemens, I think, and others. Uh, down to proportionate fines on much smaller companies. So, yes, it's in function in all the various company, countries, uh, and it's working. Um, the law always seems a bit difficult to get to grips with if you're not a lawyer. Um, famous disclaimer, how can I possibly know? Well, in this case, the people in this room can know some things about this law. In fact, the lawyers better come and talk to people like us when they're reviewing this legislation. Um, and I discovered this actually matters at least three cases so far. It's Europe. No one language is supreme in any way. And that means the GDPR exists in canonical form in multiple human languages, just as well. And in fact, I have a simple worked example of that. Here it is. Recital 15 covers um, physical as well as uh, electronic data. And it talks about whether it's structured or unstructured. And so you might re think, reading as I did, um, sets of files which are not structured shall not fall within the scope of this uh, regulation. Well, who's seen a corporate data server with unstructured data on it? Just about all of them. And so I thought, aha, loophole. Now, others had already got there before me and said, now nah, look at some of the Germanic languages. So look up German, look up Dutch. And they say things like Akten. And that cannot possibly be confused with an unstructured electronic filing system. And so I'd never seen anything like that before. Apparently, uh, the, the people who experience these things at EU level are very familiar with it. GDPR Article 32 relates to security and it drops keywords that are familiar to us and then gives ways and standards of measuring it. And so, whilst law should not be prescriptive, otherwise the lawyers always tell us it's bad law because life moves on, um, it's very much got in mind that the battle of security was lost and we failed, so to speak. We couldn't make the case. Security doesn't matter. For decade after decade, um, they would treat it like a bit of insurance or even less important than that. And of course, we have a dreadful security situation. It was time to start again. They said, OK, privacy. People can understand privacy. And big fines, they can understand that. So we're going to make it easy for them and say they shall have security. And so it talks about good practice of security, such as you might learn in any IT course. And then it says, having regard to the state of the art, which is not a reference to a culture novel by e m Banks, but um, definitely is important, very important pivot point for this. Because the state of the art is a specific reference. Again, you have to go to, to non-English languages to make sure you actually understand this. Um, collaboration, see, um, you can't do it if you're just a lawyer, you can't do it if you're just computer science, you can't do it if you're just English. Uh, it's really quite an interesting network. The state of the art means uh, what's generally done for doing a decent job. It doesn't mean the latest and greatest and fanciest. Um, and there we have the beginnings of a standard because some things, SSA 1, for example, um, is that state-of-the-art 
for uh, daily encryption for essential matters? And the answer, I think, quite clearly is no. If it's essential, you would, wouldn't be using SHA-1. SHA Otherwise, we wouldn't have SHA-3, would we? And so, uh, according to legal people, who I've been rubbing shoulders with quite a bit lately, um, we can safely say that a court, and therefore any wise company, will say it's not state-of-the-art, don't use it, see foregoing big fines. And that is very cool, because a lot of internet accessible protocols make it very clear what algorithms they're using, what, what uh, encryption um, standards they support, some of which are effectively, without much hocus-pocus, outlawed within Europe or for anything that touches the personal data of an EU resident anywhere in the world. See where I'm going with this? The dragnet's getting very big, and it's enforcing by dint of, well, um, blunt force, really, uh, improved practice that a lot of people here have been going for for years. And so, if you use RC4, which has been officially deprecated by all of the browsers, I believe, last year, was it not, finally? Certainly this year, uh, plenty of websites still support it. Uh, this gives us a reason um, to say no, because uh, it, it, is, it is clearly insecure. It's clearly not state of the art. It's been deprecated for many, many years. Um, and there is no way that a company could go to court uh, and or go to the information commission in their country and say, well, we did have a big breach, but it was actually all right because RC4 isn't. No, you can't do that. So, this is interesting, and it raises the question, we haven't quite got there yet, although I know the discussions are, having, are being had, that if you see one of these, should you not drop connections to it? There's another piece of wording, end-to-end. -end. The proposed e-privacy uh, regulation has had endless revisions, mostly to do with cookies ad tech, uh, ad tracking, uh, and, and this kind of stuff. Um, there's a lot of tensions in there, as you can imagine. Somehow or other, there has become non-controversial to say it shall include end-to-end, -end, which incidentally rules out Mr. Turnbull straight away, of course. Not just end-to-end, -end, but the end user terminal, a very carefully defined expression for a device, a computer, a thing which is the end, um, which is likely to stand the test of time. And then they added, about two or three drafts in, they added no back doors. And that was even more interesting to me, that it has persisted to the current draft. This wording does not allow for weak mathematics. Okay, there were two bits that I quoted. Um, you don't have to read the, all of it, but basically, member states should not pose, impose any obligation on encryption providers, on providers of electronic communication services that would result in weakening of the security of their networks and services, such as creation of back doors. Is anyone familiar with a piece of Australian legislation that says the opposite? <laughs> I think so. Uh, and thus we have the situation where you can have an Australian provider of services to somebody who may be an EU resident that now has to make a choice. And it's not a static environment. Uh, we know that there are um, uh, reviews being undertaken into the legislation here. People I mentioned before in a very bad font uh, are ta uh, taking the charge, the good fight to these people. Um, but I think you can highlight why um, I claim that the EU says the laws of mathematics really do apply, apply in Australia. It doesn't mean uh, it's easy. Article 28 of the GDPR is also in a funky font. Thankfully, I know this stuff quite well. <laughs> There's the concept of a data controller. Uh, that is somebody who has responsibility for looking after personal data for somebody. Nearly every company is, or organization is a data controller at one level or another. Nearly every company uses a data processor, which is the other of the two classifications, to handle some of that data. In the simple case, it might be, let us say, Dropbox or AWS to pick uh, well-known and potentially dubious examples. And so 
GDPR Article 28 says, having made these definitions, we need to ensure that wherever this data traverses a boundary, that standards are maintained. Therefore, actually specified in the text of the legislation uh, is a very, very specific contract. And the more I looked at it, in fact, the more a friend of mine gave me a kicking to actually look at it, because it's kind of easy to gloss over, uh, the more it seemed that this very specific contract was asking impossible things. This contract requires a controller and a processor to be able to verify that each, other's, uh, each other is keeping up to required standards. A controller can at any time drop into a processor and say, hey, uh, what's going on here? How are you storing the data? Uh, no, I actually need to see it. Let me have access to your system, which is scary to say the least. Um, the processor has to have some kind of authenticated communication back to the controller to say, well, there was this incident. Here it is. Here's the details. And we fixed it off, and we're all compliant again. Um, that's in a contract, a legally binding mandatory contract, and it involves access from one company to another company's systems in a way which, if you're not very careful, is quite clearly a violation of the very GDPR that has this contract in it. I did tell you there were some geeky committees involved in this because they spotted this. But these companies shouldn't trust each other, they must not trust each other, or the huge fines kick in. And so, the processor must share access to the data, but not the data itself. So that would mean some token, some password, something like that. Um, we don't have very many different kinds of passwords or keys. You can imagine that if there was some system that uh, controlled access to those tokens, um, it, it, it wouldn't be infeasibly complex. Whereas access to all the databases in use, some 200, I think, in, in common use, would, would be infeasible. And so, according to Article 28, these have to be available. And so if you keep applying um, computer science analysis to this, we look at the information flow, all of it is from the processor to the controller, either on demand or when the processor realizes, oops, something's happened. And all of a sudden there's an aha moment. Whoever put this together um, clearly knew about the kind of technology that's already popped into your head, right? What do we know about communication between parties who do not trust each other that has to be auditable, authenticated? Um, I think we've heard of this before. Audit logs are a thing that uh, we are used to seeing in legislation now, um, after, particularly after the Enron uh, scandal way back, uh, there was a whole lot of these um, electronic audit trail legislations, uh, uh, legislation around the world. Uh, in the US, they did the Sarbanes-Oxley. In the EU, they had the eighth uh, business processing directive. We're used to that. What we are not used to is an audit log for multiple entities who do not have any other relationship to each other except for this contract. So this sounds like a job for a cryptographically guaranteed, non-reputable audit trail, and of course we know how we do that. Um, this would be some kind of, excuse me, uh, this would be some kind of um, a blockchain. And we know how to do that. We've got libraries. We've, we've got expertise. Uh, and so all of a sudden, out of the murk of the, the phrases in uh, GDPR Article 28, we can suddenly see, aha, now we are required to maintain uh, very much state-of-the-art audit trails for tracking who has access to my data as it goes from one place to another place. Oh, and the big fines apply if we don't do it right. Now, this actually isn't being done. It's what it says. The lawyers agree. That's what it says. Uh, the people who put the laws together agree. That's what it says. And little bit by little bit, the level of compliance and the degree of understanding and clue involved is increasing, month on month almost. Uh, this is where, clearly where it's going. Either that or all the people analyzing this, including me, are wrong. 
Um, I, I don't think that is likely. Therefore, we have blockchain mandated uh, for audit trails in the law. I do like that. So, I think that's very nice. Now, there's another one. Ha, ah, evidently. So, um, there is another one. Uh, which was uh, GDPR Article 32, which I think we're going to come back to in questions. But where do we go to next? You've probably seen that I've touched on a very vast body of uh, interlocking requirements, needs, proposed solutions, partly implemented solutions. Um, not all the legislation I listed, not just e-privacy, has yet been fully enacted, or if it has, hasn't become into effect in all the countries. This is all new stuff. It's all happened pretty much since 2016. Um, we're looking at completely new ways uh, of backing up good system administration, secure networks. When I say backing up, I mean to say supporting for the first time ever. I mean, who actually feels like it's had the friendly hand of the law on their, their back um, once we're trying to convince management of security? Well, now we do, at least if you're in Europe or dealing with Europe. And so um, if we get to the point, as many European countries have already decided, that an insecure network is far too great of a financial risk, what do we do? Well, hopefully they'll start listening to us. Um, I can see quite a number of new error messages, three or four we need anyway, along the lines of connection drop due to insecure algorithm detected or, um, or uh, illegal network transaction attempted, as was a colleague of mine was suggesting the other day. These things are going to be popping up more and more, and all of a sudden companies that don't get with the program are going to find themselves isolated and losing customers uh, and so forth. Now, I've got a few things I want to come back with. I tried very hard to cover a giant scope, and from the hallways, I've noticed that quite a lot of people are wanting to know more detail about this. I do know something about some of it. Are there any questions at this point? Before we go back to Article 32. So. GDPR, does it apply to any EU citizen that happens to be anywhere in the world or any person who's in the EU while making the connection? Neither. Um, the GDPR applies to any EU resident anywhere in the world. The only requirement is that they must be, uh, have some right of residency, which can be a temporary studentship, uh, and they have to be an actual real person. That's it. And that is so broad. Uh, and, I mean, who is going to have a computer system that's going to make a calculation whether or not someone just ended their semester uh, uh, or not? The point is that basically needs to apply to any connection from anywhere because a US, a US citizen could be anywhere in the world connecting and they don't know that. So it's a race to the top, it's a power grab, and the United States really hates it. Right. So is that actually being applied to connections from the US, let's say? It does. And this is something that... I did say I wasn't really going to cover, but questions don't count. Um, anybody heard of the safe harbor? Right, excellent. It's dead. Um, the reason it's dead is because a gentleman called Max Schrems in Austria said, just a minute, I've got some data on a server in Ireland, and Mr. Snowden said that EU, the, the US is just raking through it all. Can't do that under EU law. So, Safe Harbor went down. They hastily cobbled together a thing called Privacy Shield, um, which is going to court right now to the European Courts of Justice. If, well, who, who can predict the court? But if that goes down again, then yes, uh, the GDPR will have triumphed over uh, the American approach, which says repeatedly, um, the Supreme Court says, the United States government has access to all data anywhere in the world, especially if an American company has access to that data. That is the tension that we have right now. 
I don't know the answer, but the GDPR has surely got some steam behind it. Thank you. Okay. Were there any others? I mean, there were before. Okay. Good. Okay. So um, we just, we talked about keywords like uh, key phrases like state of the art uh, with regard to the state of the art. That is a continually expanding definition or a continually updated definition because things that were state of the art this year may well not be, perhaps not next year, but certainly the year after they could easily be deprecated. What is the, uh, the, the half-life of uh, a piece of technology at the connection level? I don't know, but it definitely has one and we can definitely point to things that are definitely dead. So there is something else that has a continually expanding definition and I believe this is the opposite of the case in Australia uh, and almost the opposite of the case in, in the United States, which is what is personal data? It's anything that will tend to identify a natural person, which is extremely broad. And yes, it covers metadata. It covers metadata of metadata because the cleverer we are with artificial intelligence or whatever it may be to make inferences about who might be um, behind some perturbation in the data set, um, then instantly that becomes personal identifiable, uh, or rather personal data. Uh, in Australia, there was a famous case in 2017 which says that telecommunications metadata is not personal data. And the implications of that are still being worked out in this very non-expert person's understanding. Um, so we have then another power grab, if you like, another race to the top, that what is the scope of the GDPR and e-privacy and these other rules is continually expanding in terms of the definition of personal data. So practice has to keep improving and improving. Any questions about that? Because there's a lot in it. Excellent. And so, um, what are other countries doing about this? It's not um, just a matter of what laws should we implement, but it's also about civic education. So, by choosing to go for a rights-based approach, Europe is building on the concept that their citizens are more or less familiar with the notion that they got rights. You can't do that. I got rights, you know. Um, the GDPR was uh, an absolute debacle of misinformation from all possible sides. It really was not well um, sold in many ways. But eventually, for between 2016 and August 2018, uh, after much pain and much money, the message got out. I was just being told the other night that um, at the very practical level of people who have nothing to do with IT and don't really care about it, they kind of understand they have a thing called personal data and it's, it's, it's kind of theirs. That is really big and whatever laws end up being passed in Australia, if there isn't that understanding, then work needs to be done. Um, the notion in the GDPR is that the personal data belongs to you and then you opt to trade rights to that away in exchange for some services. They are limited rights, they are often time limited rights and at any point you can say no give it to somebody else or give it back to me. Um, and there are people I know who have a bit of a hobby now of going to large companies and saying, give me everything you've got on me. Um, and they have to comply. And if they don't, there's a standard complaints process. It's quite slick. Um, and there's a lot of pain for the companies involved. So it's a continually improving uh, best practice scenario again. Um, Okay, so we come back to a situation where we have multiple world leaders, um, many senators in the United States. We have uh, former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Theresa May, who went out and said a, a much less gauche version of Turnbull's comment. We have this immense pressure, and surely you can imagine that there are company, countries in Europe that uh, have runaway security services too. Yes including the biggest ones. 
And this is very neat. And I, this is my final point about the mathematics of it all. Um, remember I said at the start that the way the EU is set up, there's a whole bunch of country-specific laws um, from litter picking to what language you can talk in the shop to maybe some quite offensive laws. So long as it's not against uh, European Charter of Human Rights, then, then they can do that. That is most especially true for military matters and national security matters. And the legislation, the GDPR and e-privacy, bends over backwards to say that none of this in any way constrains a member state's right to pass legislation and take acts to defend its, its, um, to, to defend its sovereignty and its borders and its security, terrorism, think of the children, all of that stuff. But we will have end-to-end -end encryption, including the device terminal. Got them. And so my heart sank a bit the first time I read the GDPR. In fact, I read it a few times, um, and e-privacy with all of this bending over to the military, and then I realized actually no. Because 2 plus 2 equals 4, and the military can't make it otherwise. That's why it works. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Does anyone have a question for Dan? If you do, come to the front. Hi, in. Don't fall. I hate these stairs. They're scary. Yeah. Wrong. OK. Um, surely, if I'm based in Australia and I'm trying to be compliant with some law, then for just practical reasons, I have to be compliant with the Australian law first instead of something else, because Australia is more likely to beat me over the head. Well, indeed. So as was famously said, the laws that apply in Australia are the laws of Australia. So you then have the choice of not selling anything or even speaking to anybody who may be an EU resident. Do enjoy your life. <laughs> so what this means is a race to the top. Uh, already the pressure on, on the Australian system. I mean, look, the Privacy Act 1998, let's not be unfair, that's pre-digital 1998, kind of, right? Um, everybody involved apparently knows it needs updated. The point is, can they do so with a clue so that we don't have the situation of pain such as you describe? Um, because so far, the EU has shown no sign of backing down. If they're going to stare down America, I don't think Australia is going to have any impact at all. Or you could look to New Zealand, which is saying, gee, GDPR, yeah, we'll do that. And they are owned by the NSA. I mean, they are. Five eyes, right? Three of the five, five eyes, are actively trying to make two plus two equals five. The EU isn't blinking so far. That's all I got. Uh, curious, have you, are there lists of companies like in Australia and stuff that are either trying to comply or ones that are really bad actors? Such that obviously big companies like Google and such have had to put a lot of effort in and get fined or otherwise. Are there lists or websites of companies and how they comply, like especially Australian ones? So I'm not 100% sure I understood. You said in Australia, if you try and comply by excluding the bad actors. I'm just wondering, are there like websites or other stuff reporting on who the bad actors are or the ones who aren't doing a good enough job here in Australia and such? OK, um, I'm not aware of anything like that. I'm afraid the only lists of websites I know of in Australia are really ones that we don't want to exist. Um, I think more from the point of view of the legislation, it's when there's a breach, who got caught? From the point of view of computer science, the legislation says don't use really bad software. I'm not aware of anything in between. It is actually, it's not coercive in the sense it's up to every organisation to feel the fear and get on with doing, frankly, a quality professional job, perhaps for the first time in most cases. Uh, I mean, what's wrong with that? Uh, in Australia, we've done a commendable effort of trying to do an end round, run around 2 plus 2 equals 4 in the Access and Assistance Bill. That bill effectively allows the government 
to compel anyone, any company like Microsoft or Google, to construct a bug for them and to install it remotely, like via the automatic download services and patch services. Right. So they can extract any data they wish and send it back in real time to the government offices in yep. Canberra. So that's what I was referring to before. Um, the I couldn't remember the name of it. Don't live here. What is it? Uh, access and assistance bill, is it? Uh, assistance and access. That's assistance and access. I mean, that, that sounds so lovely, doesn't it? Like crutches and wheelchairs and glasses like mine. Um, it isn't. But what we have, yes, this. Uh, this is from the not yet passed e-privacy regulation. And the last, if you look at the last sentence, um, we can't impose any obligation on anybody in the chain to put in a back door. So you're not allowed to do that in Europe. And also you have end to end. You are allowed to do that in Australia. Therefore, if you are in the European ecosystem, what's the answer? Don't use any Australian stuff. Well, yes, that answer is already been. I mean, that, that, that is the answer. The European um, single digital market is 400 ish plus consumers, possibly soon to be minus some or all of Britain. Um, how big is Australia? I mean, the, these are really, really confronting things. And um, I can understand if you're in the Australian Parliament, uh, it might feel quite coercive. Um, all I can say is I think the EU's on the side of good in this one. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. This is a small token of our appreciation. Thank you so much oh. for speaking at Linuscon. Thank you very much. <laughs>